Thank you so much. Let me just share my screen and then we'll get rolling. All right, the second close. Okay. All right, so thank you for, for coming today. Uh, we're a smaller group, but that's fine. Um, and then I will also speak with those people in mind that might be watching this on YouTube later. Uh, so we won't completely go all out uh, conversational, but I will try to be yet somewhat conversational. First of all, I want to thank both of you, Alan and Lisa, not only for, for organizing this event, but in general for coming up and for starting this working group. I think periodical studies in Russian and East European studies at large have experienced really an upswing in the last 10 years. We knew periodicals always mattered, but I think we've gotten a kind of a new energy to this field but from what I've gathered kind of at conferences and the publications and so forth. So I'm really glad to see this group coming together. Periodical studies, I believe, are an opportunity also for dialogue across disciplines, across languages, across cultures. They're an opportunity to connect scholars and practitioners, to forge new solidarities, and also to amplify underrepresented voices. And this is something I would love to discuss with all of you in the end of this webinar. And I'm really uh, looking forward to hearing your thoughts. So much of this lecture is really also to provoke you and, and uh, um, hear your ideas. So today is May 6th and in other years, we would have probably gathered in a more celebratory spirit at the end of the academic year. But um, at least for me, this really feels like the end of an utterly exhausting spring semester with very little energy left. And this is also, well, I'll try to be a bit more conversational than I would usually be a bit more <laughs> all over the place. Um, it's gonna be a bit of a mixed bag of ideas and cases from the book manuscript that you mentioned that I'm currently working on. Um, and if you can, yeah, so that's kind of the, the direction I wanna to go today. In hindsight, we might say this had been coming for a long time, but as far as I'm concerned on February 24th, 2022, my intellectual work world came undone. And for me, maybe like for some of you as well, one question that started to echo in my head louder than it had ever before. In fact, too loud to focus on anything productively other than my own disappointment, my despair, my rage, my grief, the question, um, that, that kind of started echoing in my head louder than ever before as well. How do these things matter today, right? So I want to take a moment to first acknowledge that while we're talking today, the Ukrainian people are still going through the terror of a war of aggression. They experience displacement and are victims of violence and crimes against humanity. And I think it is part of our human psyche, as I understand it at least, that we get used even to witnessing war, but we can't for, allow for this to be thought of as normal. And from that arises the responsibility also of scholarship to ask what larger systems of knowledge production can we build that foster peace, that foster justice. Now it would be preposterous if I claimed that I can give you answers to anything of this, but it's something that I'm trying to work towards. And that's something that I would love again to talk to you all about in about half an hour, which is how long this, talk, this short presentation should take unless I go off script. So turning to the periodicals and starting in the current moment again, over the last two months and a half, two, two and a half months, we saw news outlets, online and print newspapers closed down or censored. And one of the things I started wondering about was where are the Russian literary or the thick journals in this today, right? That is the handful that still exists today that survived the end of the Soviet cultural system and now it is in the nature of the format of a monthly periodical, which thick journals are, that they respond poorly to current events, really. This is a matter of production cycles that ultimately have a direct impact on the intellectual qualities of the medium, right? But still, I wonder, well, what is Mouvimir, for example, doing today? And as far as I gather from the content of recent editions, of course, not much has changed. Again, this is a matter of production cycle. And these publications are neither raging nationalists nor are they outspoken oppositionals, I think. They do often live on Russian federal funding. We can't, we can't forget that. They need that to survive. But I noticed an interesting thing on Novimir's Facebook presence. 
they started publishing artwork for illustrative purposes, really, largely Western European modernism, I guess, but all repeatedly from March 16th to March 23rd with a very distinct color pattern. Um, so that's I, I have some screenshots here that, that I took during a, a sleepless night. And because I put them on here, because it leads me to one of my main interests in studying periodicals and especially Soviet thick journals that are distinctly different from the daily press and that they evade the attention of immediate political involvement. The question is, in what ways can journals facilitate engagement that is open-ended, dialogical, critical? Do they have, even within the context of author authoritarian cultural systems, do they have the power to subvert and disrupt? Or is this mode of the thick journal merely performative and ornamental. We also have to engage that possibility. So with regard to Novomir in March 22, I don't know, how, I, I suspect this is not re very relevant, right? You can see that the post of March 22nd has 15 likes. This is kind of flying largely under the radar. And um, Novomir's Facebook page has 20,000 followers, which is by the way, significantly more than its current print circulation between two and 3,000, which is also the moment to say, well, now that we're turning to the Soviet journals, the big Soviet journals in their main time, of course, had hundreds of thousands and millions of uh, millions in circulation. So this is to say that today's thick journal is barely a shadow, if at all, of what it used to be uh, for much of the 20th century. When it was this key genre, this pivotal cultural form of Soviet society, and this is really the focus of my talk today. I want to provide you with a definition of the media format and focus on two moments to illustrate its role in attempting to create a socialist cultural system. And on the way, I hope to give you the provocation to literary study that I promised in the title of this talk. We'll see about that. My provocation for starters today will be we are gonna be judging a lot of journals by their covers. It's really gonna be moving through this fairly quickly. Periodical studies as announced more than 10 years ago uh, in PMLA by the two scholars, Robert Scholes and John Latham. Periodical studies means treating periodicals not as concrete containers, uh, not as containers of texts, right? But as discrete objects of study in their own right. So peri writing periodical studies is different from writing literary history. It preferences visual and material objects over canonical literary texts and the questions that arise with that. Although, of course, those two things are never disconnected. I'm probably connecting, disconnecting them a little more uh, today for the sake of provocation. So I'd like to start with the definition of our object of study. What is a thick journal? Tolstoy journal in Russian, right? Um, now this, you may probably think is a fairly banal question. To use the, word of, the words of Supreme Court Justice uh, uh, Potter Stewart in his attempt to define obscenity, I know it when I see it, right? Brought you an image from the 1952 Great Soviet Encyclopedia, an illustration that goes with the entry journal. And truly, if this were the Soviet thick journals, it would be easy to identify um, them by their serious appearance, you know, the title on a gray cover page, if anything, accompanied just by that subheader, literary, artistic, and socio-political journal. I'm going to be saying that term a lot today. But what we are getting here, of course, is a specific snapshot. This is the landscape of Soviet literary journals after the reorganization of literary institutions in 32, after the Stalinist purges, after the economic and cultural disruption of World War II, after Zhdanov's 47 campaign against the journal Zvizda in Leningrad, this is the leftovers, the ruins after 20 years of gutting the ecosystem of Soviet literary periodicals. Another snapshot is given again in the Great Soviet Encyclopedia 1972, this time a spread of literary, artistic and sociopolitical journals of the Soviet republics. Um, and all of a sudden this approach of I know it when I see it might not quite hold up because we are seeing a lot of different things. We now have diverse cover designs and visual identities, 
using a variety of fonts, illustration, photography, suggesting that once we open these journals, we'll also find different kinds of content. And in fact, if we subscribe to one of these journals, but not the other, that might say something about who we are, right? But what remains across the board is this genre, genre denominator now that we have literaturna hudojstvani i apshistvani politiski journal. And if we were to attempt a minimal working de definition of the thick journal, we would have to include this. It features literature, art, social and political issues. And this kind of this this phrasing is where the title has fossilized, but again, it is merely the end of a long trajectory. I brought you from my kind of index of uh, periodical publications, uh, a couple of variations. Общедоступный научно-литературный художественный иллюстрированный журнал. Общественно-политический литературно-художественный рабочий журнал. Журнал литературы быта и общественной жизни, and so forth and so on, right? This is what I would like to call the logic of the hyphenated journal, right? This is the big difference from other national and regional traditions of literary periodicals. The Soviet literary journal is a periodical of literature, prose, poetry, drama, plus X, X being, of course, literary criticism, but then anything, reproductions of art, photo reportage, politics, science, nature, youth culture, sports, chess, humor, film, household tips, sewing patterns, you name it, right? And this diversity in, genre of, uh, in genres and themes brings us to the next feature of the Soviet Literary Journal, which I think is a baseline feature, the broad audience appeal and engagement. This is not the periodical for the connoisseur audience, but for a general educated reader. And of course, I would be amiss not to mention the historic origin of the Soviet literary, literary journal in the 19th century, where it was aimed at a broad readerly public from the educated middle class, as has been documented by Deborah Martin's in journal, um, volume, Literary Journals in Imperial Russia, of course, by Jeffrey Brooks. Um, the Soviet Literary journal is doubtlessly built upon the foundations of the imperial one, as much as the cultural practices and sentiments of many Russian revolutionaries were informed deeply by the 19th century intelligentsia experience. In a seminal study of red virgin soil Soviet literature in the 19, 1920s, Robert McGuire even goes as far as to observe in the rise and fall of a single 1920s periodical, Krasnaya Nov, the three main developmental phases that for him characterized the whole phenomenon, ph phenomenon, sorry, of the 19th century journal, right? So kind of the 19th century in, an, in the nutshell of the 1920s. But I think the focus on the 19th century legacies also obstructs our view. And this is why I will stop talking about thick journal and refer to our periodicals from here on out as socialist liter as the socialist literary journal with those two baseline features, hyphenation literature plus X, broad audience appeal and involvement. And the involvement part is important. As I now hope to show in my focus on two historical moments, this involvement is a vision realized to varying extents, a vision of the reader as an engaged, involved participant. Ideally speaking, this is not your consumer of the 19th century, but a new kind of socialist cultural citizen. Much has been said about the rejection of the heritage of the classics as well in early revolutionary culture, and then it's later embraced. The journal, however, stands out if we think of it as a 19th century heritage, because it was embraced by all groups across the board that were competing for cultural dominance in the 1920s, beginning not with Krasnaya Nov, but with the Pralit Kult journals in 1918. In the wake of the October Revolution, no other group was as expedient, I would say, and driven to found a new cultural order as the Prolet Code, both in terms of cultural production and the arts, as well in terms of efforts in educating workers and reshaping all aspects of their everyday life. As this movement sought to rethink the modes of creative engagement for their participants from cultural centralization to local activity, from the dichotomy between cultural producer and consumer to the proletarian as both consumer and the producer, it relied still strongly, as much as it could, we should say, on the periodical press. There were more than 30 periodicals affiliated in various ways with the movement. As a point of entry for the scholar to this movement, we can turn to a journal of theory, so not a literary journal in that sense, Kultura, 
here to the left, ran by the thinkers of the prolate cult, most prominently Bogdanov himself. Over the course of its four-year existence, the editors of Preliterskaya Kultura assessed the work of a numerous prolate cult organizations in creating their own literary journals, among them uh, Gradische and Petrograd, and regional publications such as Gradische Kultura from Tambov, Molot from Orenburg, Zarya Zavoda from Samara, Truti Turchestva from Smelensk, Pradet Kult from Yekaterina Slav, as well as another uh, one of the same name from, from Tver. Further, the Moscow-based Gorn, which we also have here. Most favorably discussed, the most successful one is uh, Gradische as the ideal prolet culture. Reviews positively remark that it is, I quote, run exclusively by writers and poets from the workers' milieu, enforcing thus the identitarian requirements right put forward by the more dogmatic thinkers of the prolet code. And while the contributions, uh, uh, well, of the contributions, I quoted, and by far not all bear the creative imprinted mood unique to the proletariat. The journal still stands out strikingly among other Germans, journals for its talent and its proletarian worldview. This is a general challenge, right, of prolate cult. You want to pr produce quality content, but you're also trying to rely on factory workers who, of course, have no experience in doing this. So the journal was among the earliest of the prolate cult publications with the first issue appearing in January 18. Still written, you can see that to the right here, still written in old orthography. The short editorial note on its first pages is predictably imbued with a pathos of anticipation, anticipation of the revolutionary future. All around is, fest, is the festive sound of the bell of the social revolution. But what is noteworthy of this uh, editorial is its addressee, which is not a reader, not the consumer of the journal as one might expect, but the creator, right? The editors conclude thus, comrades, proletarian writers and artists, we call you to the banner of the future. As one of the earliest and relatively consistent publications affiliated with Prolet Code, Radishi came to be considered a model for a number of provincial journals. If its masthead is to be trusted, the press run of the final issue in 21 reached 10,000. And that's quite impressive for that given moment. Between 11 and over 60 pages long, it featured most prominently poetry, followed by articles about theory and practice of the prolate cult and its main um, uh, departments, short prose, sporadically chronicle and reviews. Illustrations were sparse, and the visual layout of the journal speaks to the uncertainty of early proletarian culture that had to reply, uh, rely quite literally on the inventory of cultural production from pre-revolutionary times. Not only were the first issues printed in pre-revolutionary orthography or some hybrid version thereof, underwent a piecemeal transition to the new style, they also heavily relied on a set of typeface that is closely associated with pre-revolutionary bourgeois culture. And you see that again here in this image um, of the uh, in this uh, image of the cover, is Dani Kulta, Pierre Gim. Those are considered kind of modernist adjacent fonts. In fact, Lenin in 19 already had expressed objection to books that were set in this font, uh, which he deemed not, not appropriate, or that were set in generally poorly uh, and had poor typography. But despite this critique, new typesets, printing presses, et cetera, were simply not available. And if anything, the technological basis for print enterprises kept on decreasing due to wear and tear. And here, of course, the work of Jeffrey Brooks, again, is most important and foundational for all of our work on Soviet, in Soviet periodical studies, as it draws our attention to the determining role of the print and paper economy for the development of Soviet media. What we have in these journals, though, is the attempt at a new model where reader and writer, consumer and producer are identical, we don't see this as much in the layout designs yet in larger part due to material challenges, we might say of the civil war years. For late cult, we also know ended for political reasons before these periodicals could really develop their full potential. And at this point, it is the avant-garde that picked up and continued a similar thought about what it means to create journals as new socialist media. No, most noticeably, Ilya Ehrenburg and Eli Sitsky created in Berlin their short-lived journal, Appletail Wiesch, The Thing, in 1922. 
The project highlighted again the idea of a new media format that is in tune with attempts of building a new culture. Even just by looking at the first two issues of Vish, we immediately notice how the page comes to life, following kind of the constructivist paradigm of design here. So if you look at it, first we read, okay, we have kind of the, the spot and we are di directly looking at it. Now we see Vish, but then we have to start moving it around, twisting and turning, right? We want to read Objet, the French title. Then we want to turn it again. We read Gegenstand, the German title. And then we have to zoom in or get, you know, get a, no, my, oh, get a close up to read kind of the small print, right? So this is kind of the page becoming more dynamic where it highlights, again, the thin character of the journal, if you will. Numerous orientations of text, different font weight and size. Uh, the integration of photography we also see on the first couple of pages. And what this page integrates is a trilingual um, edition, right? This is German, French, Russian. So it's really, it is doing something. It is building in internationalism. It is building transnational communities. So again, the idea of avant-garde journals as not representing but doing something. This activating typography is continued by the Moscow-based journal YIF, edited by Mayakovsky, Brick, and others. Here again, the layout tries to guide our eye, grab and direct our attention, right? So in, we, we often, they work with bold, they, bold fonts. They work with a lot of lines. They work with kind of uh, really trying to um, orchestrate how we perceive this journal uh, in a more, again, engaged and involved way. And we don't commonly, or scholars don't commonly call this a thick journal, although it again, it does align with my baseline features of the genre, literature plus X, the intention to reach a broad readership, uh, monthly production cycle, at least aspirational. But here, I think it is the uh, focus of literary history on the thick journals that, that succeeded beyond the 30s that has clouded our view. In fact, contemporary observers were willing to call this a thick journal. A review of the first issue truly opens and thus Lev has its own thick journal, right? So in the 1920s, these things are in flux. And there are many different positions that truly happen on the level of what should a journal look like, not what should its content be. That is also a very important question, but what should it look like? What is fossilized in our perception um, as a Soviet thick journal is largely framed by publications that followed later and that survived, again, the Stalinist reorganization, the consolidation of Soviet literature, so Krasnaya Nov until um, the early 40s, Novimir, Aktyabr, and so forth. And in these journals, I think I brought you a picture from Krasnaya Nov, yeah? These journals, we found erased the material and visual dimension that was heightened before. So here's this example. Um, in Krasnaya Nov, there's really, in terms of layout design, there's not much for us to talk about here, other than it's not very user-friendly. Um, I mean, this is a photo of a microfilm, but even, even before, it was really about squeezing a lot of text. The, the, the focus was that encyclopedic uh, compilation of text. A scholarship such as Maguire's foundational book on Krasnayanov has focused on the journals largely through the lens of their content. In fact, a content. In fact, uh, Red Virgin Soil today really reads as a book merely about the competition between different groups for dominance in early Soviet culture, rather than a study of the medium as such. And in this lies the provocation of periodical studies to insist on addressing form, the form of the medium rather than the content. With this in mind, I want to turn to now the second moment in Soviet culture that I want to address today, namely the thaw. So this image you saw on the, uh, the, the image you saw on the advertising poster for our meeting today is a still from Georgi Danilia's 1964 Yashagayo Pamaskia, where the journal comes to figure prominently as emblematic for thaw culture. So here, the three main characters are looking at a copy of Eunice. After all, this is a film very much about the material culture of the 1960s, as much as it is about youth culture. 
And most prominently, it is the journal as the physical object that we see in the film, not its content, not its editorial office. We have an encounter with an editor, but a very odd one. And when Russia's Channel One created a colorful period drama about the thaw in 2017 called Farzai, any of you seen that? Uh, uh, maybe translated as the Black Marketeers, it is or was on Netflix. So when they created this period drama, uh, they picked up the same journal in a very similar function in its plot to support the nostalgic image of thaw culture. So here are two stills from that uh, TV show. The journal is Unist, that began in 1955 and is thought of today as one of the main forces of cultural liberalization during the thought together with Novimir. And it was part of a whole wave of literary journals that emerged or were revived from a hiatus between 54 and 57. Now, we'll take a quick look at them because I don't want to focus on Unist as much, but on the, the lesser known ones today. So started with Unist. Druzhba Narodov had been around from the 30s, but really not active in, um, later. Inestranaya Literatura, Neva, Angara, Ural, Don, Padyom. Padyom is where I want to leave off. Padyom, I want to dwell on for a moment to understand this auspicious moment in the history of the socialist literary journal. It is one of the lesser known regional journals, as I said, founded in Varonish in 57. And its inaugural issue gives away something very interesting. It says, the 20th Congress of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in deciding the tasks of building communism in our country has paid huge attention to questions of growing and developing culture, art, and literature. The directives of the six five-year plan project an increase in book, journal, and newspaper production. So in this editorial inter, there is no talk, of course, about, about de-Stalinization or anything like that. That is not part of it. We're talking about uh, the, the five-year plan. And this is important, the expansions of, expansion of the ecosystem of the socialist journal after the Stalinist years is closely intertwined with Khrushchev's plans for economic expansion. We can find a direct correlation between the plans for an increase in paper production and the increase in, in available periodicals in the Soviet 50s and 60s. I would go as far as to argue that the liberalization and aesthetic and social diversification of, late Soviet, of the late Soviet journal wouldn't have happened without the push for economic growth toward the goal of finally establishing communism as then announced in the 22nd Party Congress, right? This is uh, um, uh, not as much again, a, an idea about thaw as much as it is an idea about economic expansion. And for a journal like Padyom, the question is then, well, you see all these beautiful German journals here, what do we fill them with, right? There's a limited amount of good literature available for all these publications after all. So the, the role of this journal had to be regionally determined. Based in the city of Varunish, it was to contribute the, uh, to culturally uniting the whole central Black Earth region. That was kind of its mission. As the editors announced in the first issue, the journal was to reflect in novels, poets, short stories, poems, woodchurks, and journalistic articles, the heroic labor and the multifaceted life of workers, kolkhoz famas, and the intelligentsia of our oblasts. Oriented toward the Soviet mainstream and form, but regional in terms of contributors and themes, um, uh, the journal's identity is therefore determined very narrowly here. Regional literary periodicals of the late 50s were not necessarily representative of the disruption of literature that are commonly associated with the thaw, the departure of aesthetic or orthodoxy that could be observed in central publications. But the expansion of the literary press Anna Khrushchev is not driven by a departure from the Soviet aesthetic and ideological mainstream, but simply the logic of expansion and regional saturation. And in that way, it is similar again to the prolate cult. What was the prolate cult uh, in its journals about? It was about decentralization, right? Things needed to happen locally. The details of these journals emergence shed light on the entanglements between party organization, part literary bureaucracy, and literary organizers. Why the development of these journals was driven by the respective regional sections of the writers' union, that's why it gets a little technical. The approval process involved multiple hoops. 
you can probably imagine. Ultimately, it was the Central Committee in Moscow that decided about the allocation of means. And the journal Padyom again can serve as an example here. The first stage involved petitioning the oblast committee of the party, who then advocated before the ZK. After approval, the Writers' Union's Commission for Russian Literature took on the role of guiding, or I want to say based on archival documents, took on the role of micromanaging their colleagues in the region. In late 57, Maxim Padabedov, inaugural chief editor of Padyom, received a letter of guidance from Moscow, from the Writers' Union's Commission for Russian Literature. Needless to say, the colleagues in Moscow had objections about content as well as layout, especially cover designs. And I quote here from a letter, you know very well yourself that a journal's cover is not a minor issue. But here's the thing, the first issues of Padyom and Don decide the permission of further new journals, the Volga and in the Euro, and also the improvement of conditions for Sibirsky Agni and Dalny Vostok. The formation of individual regional journals is not merely an issue of local literary culture, in other words, but directly connected to an institutional network at the center of which stood the Writers' Union. So I think I have a couple more examples from that first year um, of kind of that visual identity that was developed. The first one is an image of a literary monument in Vaudoinish. The second one is kind of a regional landscape. I, I think this is a woodcut, which was a fairly popular um, genre in periodicals at the time and, and Soviet, Soviet art of the thought at large. And then an image, kind of a predictable image of uh, construction in the region. And then I think I also brought a, um, an image here of a, a illustration to a literary text, text. This is slightly later from 61. What is interesting about these journals, they created more pressure to have illustration across the board. So the kind of the most conservative thick journals, Novimir Akhtiabr, did not have illustration for the most part. But the late 50s moment really brought a push toward illustration, even in literary journals. And here is a quite interesting one. This is what um, Favorsky, the thinker of book illustration, would, would maybe call that, that idea of the window into the page, right? The idea that we're not seeing an image that is just kind of two-dimensional space next to it, illustrating what we already see. We are moving from the lines of the text to the furrows. Is that what you call it? What, what, a, what a plow leaves behind? Um, right? We're, and we are drawn into that page, really, which again, goes to, to in that direction of thinking about the journal as a visual object and, and kind of as an object that, that the reader is drawn into rather than just a collection of texts. The Writers Union's viable interest in supporting regional publications had another motive, specifically for the group advocating for the formation of the Union of Writers of the RSFSR, so a dedicated organization for the Russian Soviet Republic that was mirroring the existing writers' unions for the other republics. This did not exist. Um, uh, uh, Russian Russophone authors from uh, the Russian Soviet Republic uh, were served under the umbrella of the Soviet Writers Union at large, and this uh, a kind of uh, this move toward a Russian organization succeeded uh, in '58, and these regional journals really became an important kind of argument to say, well, here we have this regional organization, and we have this kind of truly local work that has is is truly unique, not to the Soviet Union at large, but to regions um, of Soviet Russia. So here, ultimately, I think we have an example of how the material foundation of periodicals pushed forward specifically through the visual, uh, and, and, and which kind of led and supported the formation or, or uh, reformation of social organizations. We do know the further history of the Writers' Union of the RSFSI, um, how it became an um, antagonistic force, force within the Soviet literary establishment, um, kind of uh, problematic in many ways, which is, is a topic probably for another day. But so I think there is something meaningful to be seen here, again, starting at the material foundation and moving kind of through, uh, uh, through that visual object of the journal toward um, that kind of uh, 
storytelling of, of, Soviet, uh, of the history of Soviet culture. So this is what I tried to demonstrate here, that in a way the late socialist journal cashed in on a promise of the early socialist one to decentralize organization, to shape society, to activate cultural producers and consumers, readjust their relationship with each other. This is also what I hope to demonstrate in greater detail in my book. I'm really just in the weeds of it right now. Um, so uh, how the journal shaped Soviet culture, right? And I hope this quick and somewhat punctuated overview, or, or uh, uh, can't even really call it an overview, gave you a notion of, of my overall approach of, of pro the provocation of periodical studies. And this is my question. We are a small group today. This is my question kind of for all of you. And, and I'd be really curious to hear what you, what your thoughts on this are, where, what periodical studies can do moving forward, right? What are the cases that you are interested in, the questions or ideas that you're interested in, or the narratives that you would like to provoke? Um, and that's really all I uh, wanted to say today as to not over overburden us. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much.